All right. And the Lord gave me this here, and I pray that everyone will, amen, remain until we finish the complete sermon here. Um, the Lord spoke to me and gave me this title, If You Are Ready for Change, Accept the Challenge. Say that to yourself. If I'm ready for change, I must accept the challenge. Now, can you all digest that for a moment? Amen. Uh, if you're ready for change, are you willing to accept the challenge? Can you catch that? Can you all can think, think on that for a moment? Say this one more time. If I'm ready for change, am I ready for a challenge? Now, I want you to get that in your spirit. Now, the reason why I said it is because, see, many times we ask God to do things in our life. Lord, I want you to do this, and I'm ready to change this, and I'm ready to, amen, uh, cross every T and dot every I. I'm ready for it, Lord. Now, you said you're ready for change, but then besides changes, there come challenges. Now, let me, let me say to the church, many times people in the Christian world is not equipped for change. Forget challenge. They change sometimes. People are ready for change. But when they do step up to change, the next step is they, they can handle challenge. And this is where you got to now, amen, cross every T and dot every I. Even the Bible says here, amen, that we ought to put on all your pajamas. Thank you. Put on the whole armor of God. Why is that? That you may be able to stand against the what? Wow. And the wiles of the devil is the tricks, the strategies. The Greek word is uh, uh, methodos, amen, where he travels up a road. And traveling up a road, that means he knows how to get to our mind. Travels from in our inner man to your mind. See, if the devil can get your mind, he can change your heart. Amen, somebody. So the Bible says here, amen, the wiles of the devil, the methodos, amen, where he tricks and schemes and he plays little things on, you know, if this ain't right and that ain't right and, 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 and you know, even little things, you know, they didn't speak to me. So that bothers some people. And then they feel that they should just quit their whole ministry because somebody say bye bye. See, these are the tricks and schemes of the devil, how he plays on people. But here's the thing. If you're really ready for change, you will accept the challenge. Amen, somebody. And I want to take you to our scripture on this morning where, amen, uh, there was a man. Let's go to 1 Samuel, if you would, chapter 22. And I'm going to start here around verse 2. And I want to talk um, this morning, David was a king. But David, when he walked into his anointing elder, he had accepted challenges that was before him. Huh? 1 Samuel 22 and 2. So we look here and David said, now, Lord, you know, and sometimes it feels so good to walk in a position. But you don't know sometimes the weight that a position holds. Someone said, you know, you know, I can't wait to be a supervisor of my job. I want that promotion. And you don't know, you got a whole lot of workers around you who are insubordinate. You got workers around you that keep you up all night because the work wasn't completed. And your superior is getting on you because they're not doing what they're supposed to do. But remember, you wanted that position. But can you handle the challenge? We, we want the position of being a wife or a husband. Oh, I can't wait to get married. And it's wonderful to walk down the aisle. Because remember, I learned this a long time ago. Wedding is one day. But marriage is lifetime. And so many people prepare for the wedding. But they're not prepared for the marriage. Can't get no amens. 
So you have to now prepare your mind that not only are we, because, you know, we spend some time, I heard that they, people spend up to six months preparing. Amen. Somebody's doctor calling. We spend six months in, in, in the getting the wedding and the videos and the cameraman and, and, and the place you're going to be and the food. Six months, invitations, all this going on here. Balloons and everything else going on. And we spend six months and then we get that wedding day. But a lot of times people didn't prepare for the marriage after the wedding. Even people prepare for the honeymoon. We're going to be in a big shoe. And water's in that big shoe. Come on here. Amen. We're going to be in a beautiful bubble bath. That's the honeymoon. But after you come out of the honeymoon, amen, can you deal with the reality of who you with and what you got to deal with? Say amen, somebody. It's easy to say now, I want some children. Oh, I want my own babies, whatnot. But you don't know the challenges are going to happen when you have children on this earth. Because see, sometimes the way you raise them is not the way they become. Sometimes, amen, uh, you try to turn them into something, but they turn out to something. And so we have to understand that that's part of the challenge of saying, I want a child. I want a marriage. I want to be a minister one day. Oh, I can't wait. I want God to anoint me with some root. Woo, give me that olive oil. And, you know, it's all wonderful on your day of ordination. But what about the days of disappointment? It's wonderful to be a pastor sometime and everybody comes to the church and say, oh, yeah, he got a new church. They fly in that door and they want to see what you have. Because a lot of them people would have you as you go into a ministry, they don't really tend on being there. They want to see your church first. And then they don't stay with you. You got quiet. I have a lot of pastor friends that opened up a church and they had, you know, amen, uh, 250 people came out and whatnot. And the following Sunday was, amen, maybe if not lucky if they had 20. But all them folk came out. And sometimes they say, get your building. I'm going to be with you. And you do all that. And that's why you cannot let people lead you. You got to be led by God. Amen, somebody. I went to that experience years ago. I was with the Y, and they said, you, this is the YWC ain't no church. You get your church, I'm coming to join your bishop. I got my first little church on Fulton Street. They ain't never came to my church to even walk in the door. In the door. Mind you, you know, being a member. But so we have to understand, um, change brings challenges. Change brings challenges. A butterfly it's beautiful with its wings, but people don't know the challenge it went through when it was in the cocoon. It's beautiful when a man of God comes out and he's preaching the gospel, but no one knows the heartache and the heartbreak and the things he had to go through to survive in ministry. A lot of people don't understand. They see people come out and marry couples and say, you know what? Oh, they look so wonderful together. But they don't know the struggles they had to go through when the battles where the enemy tried to make them divorce each other. People don't know about those things. All they see is the beauty of you got out of your car and you walking down the aisle and you holding hands with your wife. But they don't know there was a battle that tried to destroy that union. But here's the thing. The good thing about this is people who hang in there have, have accepted the challenge. They made a change. And the reason why they, you still see them, because they accepted the challenge. When you cannot accept a challenge, your change will change you. Can't get no amens. 
Let me say it one more time. When you cannot accept a challenge, your change that you ask for will change you. I can't wait to get my business. If I get my business, whoo, Lord. But you don't understand, you get the business, there's pressure sometime in the business. It's pressure when you're trying to do everything. And if you're by yourself or an entrepreneur by yourself, sometimes you got to do everything yourself. And then sometimes if you're lucky to get a couple of staff people to work with you, sometimes the staff people are slowful. They don't get things done on time. And now you're under all this pressure because you are the B-O-S-S, CEO. And sometimes when that's on you, you go home and cry on your pillow and say, Lord, I don't know if I even want this business anymore. I don't, I don't think I should be in this business because it's too much pressure. But remember, when you ask for change, there will be a challenge. And then on, look here in 1 Samuel. The Bible says here, now, David himself really didn't ask to become a king. Sometimes God, amen, employs you. In that office. Like let me say here to most ministers over here. Most likely you didn't ask to be a minister. God gives you a ministry. Calls you to be a minister. Many are what? Called. And few are chosen. That's another area there. But let's talk about here. Some many, many people are called. Some people just went. They just jumped up and said, I think I need a collar. But no, 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 no. you got to be called in the ministry. Because in the call of ministry, there's a challenge. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be on the pulpit. Just having the title, minister, servant of God, you can go through some challenges. You hear that? And uh, I, I, I got to throw this in. And some of our greatest challenges come from our own family sometimes. That's why Jesus said these words, a prophet is not honored among his own countrymen. Or his kindred, I should say. Amen. Because sometimes people who know you are over familiar with you. And they don't accept the, that fact that you are highly anointed and called a minister. Amen. But David here now was minding his own business, amen, keep of the sheep. And you know, the anointing fell on him because the Lord was looking for someone who had a heart to keep things in order. The sons of Jesse, no doubt they were good men, but they wasn't chosen because God was looking at, for someone who had the heart of God. And he had, David had a heart of God because, you know, a sheep is the Lord's foe. You know, now watch this here. So now David is key of the keep of the sheep. What was the brothers doing? Who knows what they were doing? Maybe they're businessmen. Maybe they were, amen, uh, 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 I don't know, entrepreneurs. Maybe they were um, trainers, weight trainers, weight lifters. We don't know what they were. But we do know one thing is this. That every time Samuel said, this is the one, this is the one, the Lord said, no, 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 reject, uh, come on, amen, delusional, gone. Not the one. And he said, well, there's no more sons, so we, we finish. And the father said, but there's one more son I have in the backside of the desert. Now him, I don't, I don't know if y'all want to deal with him. He's, you know, a ruddy little dude in keep of the sheep. And um, matter of fact, he probably smell like sheep. You know, when you work in a farm, you start smelling like the farm. You know that? Amen. That's why I, don't, I refuse to work around elephants. But let me go back here. So, but now David is the dirty guy in the sheepfold, feeding those sheep and carrying them. He said, bring him to me. I want to see this man, David. And David shows up. And now, guess what? The Lord said, he is the one. Amen. Isn't it something how we can overlook the one that you think would not be the one? And that will be the one. Amen. So now, let's go next. Let's go to, let's just go up a couple of chapters. David now is being attacked by his prior successor or success uh, successor I should say that is that right successor, successor right yes. 
Otherwise, Saul was once king. Saul lost position. And Saul envied David because David was now the new boy on the block. Understand my point? David now is humble. David don't want to fight with Saul, but Saul is out to kill David. Have anyone here had enemies after you and you did them no wrong? Didn't do nothing, but they want to kill you out. They want to take you out. They're fighting against you. You didn't do anything. You just... You can't help if God called you. You can't help if you're the chosen one. Amen, somebody. And David said, I didn't ask for the anointing. I didn't, ask, no, I didn't call Samuel to bring the a horn or an anointing of my life. He said, God sent me to anoint you to be king over my people. And that's why, amen, is the difference between the anointings. See, Saul no doubt probably needed a horn of oil because he had a lot of problems. But he was anointed with a vowel oil. David was anointed with a horn of oil. And I believe this year, the horn was represented the challenges that David is going to need to fight off his enemies. Because right after this now, David is in war with a big man called Goliath. And let me ask the church here, how many here got some Goliaths in your life? Some giants in your life? Amen, somebody. And we don't, we don't want to talk about the Goliaths in our life. Because, see, Goliath don't mean so much the giant that you see, but sometimes the giant that you are hiding. What giants do you have in your life that you are hiding? Amen. Now, here's the thing. You need to kill the giant. Whether it's anger, disrespect, pride, habits, amen, that you're hiding, amen, whether you habitual habit, addicted to some kind of drug, you know, sometimes these are giants in our life. We don't, we don't talk about it because we're knowing, we, you got to keep it quiet. But if that's a giant, you got to kill that giant because anything addictive will kill you eventually. Amen, somebody. You can't crack your way to heaven. You can't shoot your way up in your arm all the way to God's kingdom. You got to now change because that's a giant that you got to face. You can't bring anger to heaven. You're angry at the angels because they got your arms lifting you up trying to take you up. You got to take away your anger. And I, I talked about some time ago, misplaced anger, where people, they're angry at something over here, but they take it out on you over here. Misplaced anger. That's why I try to teach people in the church, and I've seen this here, if the usher don't say hello to them, they say, I'm not coming back to the church no more. Amen. See, misplaced anger, you met at a usher, but you take it out on the pastor in the whole church. When you didn't even know that the usher was deaf and dumb. Come on, talk to me. But let me go back here. So, so but let's go for David. David now is fighting. He's running for his life. Saul is out to kill him for no reason. But then it is a reason. It's his own reason. He became jealous. He was envious because he failed the plan of God. And God said here, well, amen. And I'm going to tell you something now. We got to understand this in the church. God said in his word, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. Amen. For some reason, God did not tolerate Saul's first mistake. But David made a few mistakes. And God said, he's a man of my own heart. And the difference is this here, and I, I began to kind of study this. David had a repentant heart. When he messed up, he went to God and said, Lord, forgive me. Some people have a sinful heart, but never repent. 
No doubt that's how Saul was. Instead of saying, Lord, please forgive me, he went on saying, I have completed the commandment of the Lord. Right there, he was showing no repentance. He should have said, no, you're right. I'm wrong. I did wrong. But eventually, through interrogation, Samuel said, tell me the truth. And he said these words. The truth is this. I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. Let me explain to many of you who are listening. If you're going to be a leader, that's a change in your life. But the challenge is this. Are you going to listen to people or listen to God? Now, understand, that's going to be a challenge. Because here's the problem. We need people. But when people rise up, what are you going to do then when they want you to hear their voice? And God said, I want you to hear my voice. Sometimes you got to make up your mind that, wait a minute, I, I'm, I'm listening and I need the people with me, but if I disobey God, what's going to happen then? But I learned something. Here's a scripture for many of you. When a man's ways please the Lord, he'll make your enemies at peace with you. You, you got to get to the point of being tough. Teflon John tough. I'm not taking this. I'm going to deal with it. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to hurt. But I got to deal with it. But here's the thing. Remember the Lord said in, in Psalm 66, he have let men ride over us. But he brought us to a wealthy place. So, so you have to go through a challenge. But at the end of the day, they're going to say, you're doing well. You know why you're doing well? Because you obey God's voice. Say amen. amen. Now watch this. I'm going further here. Now watch this here. So now let's go to uh, 1 Samuel 22 and 2. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto David. And he became now remember this, David wasn't a captain. He became a captain over them, and there were about, with him, about 400 men. Now watch this here. Let's, let's break this down for a minute. All these men ran to David. Now wait, here's, here's the thing. David ran to the cave for protection. He ran to the cave because Saul was seeking to kill him. Now watch this. I want you to digest this very well. Now, if he's running, now what is our natural? If I'm trying to run for my life, I don't need you running with me. You slow my, my pace down. I said, I, I need somebody to come on, unless you got a boat to get me out of here. But everybody in the Lord said here, see, this is the man I chose. Because I'm going to show you something. See, see sometimes... You don't even know the greatness that's on the inside of you. You think that you're carrying your own self. God said, no, you can carry more weight. Because now, look at verse 3. Not only did 400 men come, but it talks about his father and his brethren came with him. Isn't that something? The household came. So listen, not only is your friends coming and all these, it got, and why did they go there? You know why they went there? Because... Saul was killing everybody. And somehow people started losing out. They started beating everybody up. So Saul was, they was running for their life too. They said, listen, we are running for our life because Saul is a madman. And anything go wrong, he's after us. So now David runs to the cave of Adullam. But before he went to Adullam, he went to a place called Gath, G-A-T-H. And he went to Gath. He said, well, what am I doing here? Because now at Gath, there's the Philistines there. So now he's saying, now, wait a minute now. I'm trying to go to, to protect my life, but I'm in Gath where the Philistines are. Those are my enemies. So he thought, let me find a more secret place called Adullam, the cave of Adullam. And the word uh, Dulem also mean really uh, is a stronghold. That's number one. It's a place of refuge. It's a hiding place. And also is a place to retreat. 
So he's running away to get his life in order. I, I just need, you know, have anybody been so bogged, bogged down with everything? You just needed a quiet place by yourself. And I mean, you don't want nobody. You don't even want your TV there. Y'all don't want you here this week. Samsung, stay home. Sony, stay home. LG, come on in. Insignia TVs, get out my face. I need you by myself. I need to think for a minute because so much pressure is coming from me. Everything's coming at me. And so David's trying to run to a place called Adullam. He said, you know what? Got it. Peace. Everything is good. I can think now. Now I got to think clearly how to get away from Saul, stay away from him. And then while he's doing his thinking, all of a sudden, 400 men who's not in divine order runs to him with problems. Let me explain to some of you right now in the church how many of you had to take on the burden of your people, whether it's your family, whether it's sons and daughters, whether it's a relative, or someone, you had to take on that burden. Say amen if you've been there. Amen. You ever see folk who spend all their money and they know it's supposed to pay that cell phone bill, they don't want you to pay it. Amen. So now David, David is there. David is there. And he's talking to God now. Is this real? 400 men is coming to me? Now wait a minute. These 400 men didn't come prepared. They came unequipped. These men came with problems. Have you taken on people who got problems? Some of you can't say amen because they're in church, but that's all right. You have taken on all these problems. 400 men in debt, discontent, distress. And they come into me. Now watch this here. Number one, you see that they came to him. They were looking for help. Number two, they needed David's direction. But number three, if you want me to help you, you have to submit to my authority. Because it tells us, go back to 22, it says, and God made him really a captain over them. Which means David took these men and started a military troop. You see that? They gathered themselves unto him, and he became. He wasn't in the beginning, but when he saw 400 men, he started making a military troop. He made them what they need to be, but he became the captain over them. You got that? See, remember here, don't come asking for help if you don't want to come under. You, you ever see people, they come and ask you, can they do something, but they already got the answer? Yeah. That's, I, you, I can't help you if you already got the answer. Amen. But if you, if you open the door and I give me a word to give to you, I'm going to give you that word. Now, you may not agree with the word, but I'm going to give you the word. So what happened is they humbled themselves under the hand of David because they said we have to submit to his authority. We want change. And the challenge is this. He's different from Saul. He's going to tell us something different. Amen. All right? Now, I want you to remember this here. There are two principles in the universe. Somebody said two principles. The first principle is this. The authority of God is a principle on this earth. The second principle is this. The, uh, the, the principle of Satan, which equals rebellion. Now, I'm going to go to Romans chapter 13, verse 1. I want you to see here. See, there's two type of uh, 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 things that are going to operate in this earth. It's going to be a principle of God and authority or the principle of rebellion that equals Satan. Now, anyone knows this here. When you obey God, you're walking on his authority. When we disregard what God is saying, then we are in the kingdom or the universe of satanic influences. 
If someone tell you to do wrong, when you know to do right, and you do wrong, you're listening to the universe of Satan. The principles of Satan. Now the Bible tells me in Romans 13 and 1, let some souls, let me read this clearly, let a few souls, I don't, what did y'all say? Let every soul be what? See, subjugated unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. Now y'all understand it? Wait, wait, y'all catch this here? Satan's power came from God. There's no powers but of God. Amen. Now, I didn't say God gave him evil power. I say God gave him power. Yes. Yes. This is what you, you want to do with the power. If you're a prophet, you want to preach a false word or a true word. See, you, you're prophetic, but are you preaching truth? If I gave you a match, elder... I give you a match. You could do two things to the match. You can make you a nice barbecue in the backyard, or you could burn a house down. But I gave you a match. I didn't tell you what to do with the match. When you have power given to Satan, God said that all power is the mine. I'm giving you power, but I'm not giving you power to do evil. It's neutral is what you do with it. For there is no power but of God. And the powers that be are ordained of God. You got that? Verse 2. Okay. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power that God has ordained, resisting the ordinance of God. Huh? Let me finish that. And they that resist, listen carefully, shall receive to themselves damnation. Now watch this here. People cannot damn you. You damn yourself. Because it says when you resist the power, you receive damnation to yourselves. Y'all got that? And then verse 3 says what? For rulers are not a terror to good works. But they are terror to the evil. That's why sometimes a lot of ministers are rejected. You know why? Because we ain't a terror to good works. We're a terror to evil. Amen? You get around certain people, they don't want you around them. You know why? Because you, you are a terror to them when you walk into their house. You are a terror to them when you walk in their company. You know why? Because they, they want to deal with evil works. But you become a terror to evil works. But he said here again, Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Verse 4. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. You see that? See, sometimes people think that the leader is an evil person because he's telling them some things that they have to do. And the Bible says a minister is there for your good. We're trying to give you instruction. You know, like I said, you know, if you graduate from university, they'll tell you what's needed to fill out your, you know, your, your curriculum, whatever you are majoring in, you have to now go by the rules. Is that right? Yeah. You know, I remember um, when we didn't want to do classwork, um, and we were always trying to find, um, to fill out our card, they wanted you know, certain credits, we always tried to try, try to find physical ed. You'll miss that right there. Amen. Why do you think we're trying to get physical aid? So we can go to the gym and play basketball, jump around, come on here and run around the gym. We didn't want to do no work, so we said, oh, let's fill out with physical aid. <laughs> come on, somebody. So we're trying to find less subjects. But in order to graduate, there's a curriculum that you got to complete some subjects on that roster. Amen. You got that? You can't get away with everything. Amen. And some of y'all looking like you've never been to school, but that's all right. We'll pray for you after service. So watch this here. Now, again, let's go to the next thing here. So now it tells us here, he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do 
that which is evil be afraid. For he, the minister, beareth not the sword in vain. He is a minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. See, we hold a word to speak in this atmosphere. When you do wrong, a minister has the power to execute God's judgment on you. I know it's kind of tight, but it's right. It tells us right there. Now, the next thing is this here. Let's go to 1 Peter 2, and let's look at around verse 3. 1 Peter 2. I'm going to show you how if you're looking for change, you got to accept challenge. I remember being with my bishop and I had to break it down. A lot of stuff that I used to do because he told me to do, do, do things differently. So I had to, you know, go his way. And I'm glad that I did because I had to learn a lot. Okay. Yeah, 1 Peter 2, verses 3. Okay. All right. All right. If so be, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Verse 4. Okay. All right, this is not thing else. This is what I'm trying to get. To whom? No, 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 no. Uh -uh. Do you have it in that scripture here? We're talking about, amen, submitting yourselves. Amen, let me look over here. I wonder if I gave you the wrong scripture. It could have been in first, could have been in second Peter. Let me see. Amen. Let me, give me a minute for here. Let me just look into this here for a minute. Okay, let me go to Second Peter. You'll bear with me a moment. Amen. Uh -huh. Well, never listen. I must have lost that script. I'm gonna leave that alone right now. But here's the thing. This is what it's about. It says submitting yourselves to each other. That's what it talks about in the, in the book of Peter. Okay. Now watch this here. Submission means a lot because submission means you come under subjection to authority. Now, I want you to go to Numbers chapter 16, if you would. Numbers 16 and verse 41. We'll go there. Now, here it is. When we are submitted to authority, and, and please take this in love, you don't have a say-so. If God tells us to do something one way, God, Jesus told Many of his followers or disciples, it was not the 12 disciples, but many of his disciples, followers, he said, do not leave Jerusalem, but go and wait for the promise. And the Bible says in Acts 2, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, listen carefully, they were all in one place, in one accord, which tells me nobody went home. They were all in one place. That means nobody said, listen, I got to go. I've been here for 40 days talking to this master. I got to go. I'm jetting out of here. No, they were all in one place. You know why? They submitted to the authority, the voice of the Lord. And at, excuse me, Numbers chapter 16, verse 41. Go to verse 41, if you would. 41. Now watch this here. Moses and Aaron were connected. Aaron had to learn a lot too because Aaron had mistakes. You remember he made the golden calf? Sometimes you make mistakes, but you can always rekindle the fire by listening to leadership. So if you notice here now, Aaron and Moses working together. And it says here, but on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. See, sometimes people get around with conspiracies. They say, oh, you ain't doing right. This and they say, be careful what you say, because especially when it's not true, you'll reach judgment. Verse 42, watch this here. I want you to listen carefully to this. And it came to pass... When the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, 
What happened? They looked towards the tabernacle of the congregation. Now they're looking out there. And behold, a cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord appeared. So while they're looking out at the congregation, a cloud appeared. God's glory got into the atmosphere. Verse 43. And it said here, and Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation, 44. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, get you up from among this congregation. This is what God was saying. Watch this here. That I may consume them in, as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. Now, wait a minute. Y'all heard that? God got angry at the congregation. Why? Because they start murmuring against Aaron and Moses. They had the wrong voice. They told Aaron and Moses, you come to kill the whole congregation. How can God call the deliverer to deliver them? And they say at the same time, you're killing them. And God got angry because it was a falsified deception. He said, get up from among them. I'm going to consume the congregation as in a moment. That's what you call judgment, church. Verse 46 says what? And Moses said to Aaron, take a censer, put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation. And listen, what you do, make atonement for them. For the, this is wrath, for there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. Now watch what happened. God sent the plague on the children, children of Israel, because of their talking. And we as a church must always remember this. Don't be so quick to judge things, because you may not know what you're judging. Don't be so quick to, to set out a lie against leadership. And what happened is they were lying against Aaron and Moses saying, you come to kill the congregation. No, he was trying to bring them to order. And sometimes people are asking for order, but they don't want to change. Amen. Amen. We want this to be like this. We really, but then we say, now, this is going gonna, gonna to be like this. We don't want to change because, you know what, change is a challenge to certain people. If you want to be successful, you have to challenge your own flesh to say, I'm changing it. If you want to be successful. Because, see, a lot of times... If we keep doing things the ancient way, the old way, and won't change or accept change, you know what happened? In the book of, uh, I think it was Exodus, where the cloud followed them in the day and a, a pillar of fire by night, but eventually it left. You can't follow something that's not there no longer. Whew. Amen. I, I'm going to hit you with this hard one. Even some of our old traditions need to change. Yeah. See, some people are not accepting it. I, I know we grew up, and I tell you before, I was saying about here, I grew up in the, in the era where uh, the Temptations and James Brown, you remember that elder back in the day? You remember Jackie Wilson? I'm talking calling those days. Y'all don't know who Jackie Wilson is. How many know who Jackie Wilson? Raise your hand. Want me singing for y'all? Yeah. Amen. When you sing, your love is lifting me higher than I've ever been lifted before. Amen. <laughs> Don't start no dancing over here. She in the corner said, keep on lifting. All right. Here it is. Watch this here. But I'm saying that if we don't change, we wouldn't know who little baby is. I think you're called little baby. Is it little baby? <laughs> right? So how do you know who little baby is? There's your hand. They don't even know that. Did y'all have record plays or CDs? <laughs> so, but there's a new era of people that's going on. I remember years ago when the twist came out, years ago. Now, you know, that's so, my God, that's ancient. Today, there's no, there's no, you couldn't tell people what a, a, a get together, if they had a get together, do the twist. So what I'm trying to say, we have to be ready for change. Y'all got that? So Aaron 
And Moses is speaking into their lives, but they don't understand that. So now what happens here, God was angry because they start murmuring. And God sent judgment on them. He said, let me consume them in a moment. Let me tell you something. This pandemic didn't take no time to reach the world. It reached quick. I'll never forget, we were in church one day on a Tuesday Tuesday night. No, no, Sunday night. And we had one more. We said, they said, the the government's talking about closing our churches. And we came that Tuesday. It was like a ghost town. We said, what What in the world? Where did everybody go? I don't know if they got plagued or what. But it happened quick. And then all of a sudden, everything started closing down. And even today, there's still now recovery. Some people never recover it. What I'm trying to say is that stores never open back up. Amen. They, they, come on here. You know, they, they're so afraid now. They keep in the restaurant, the street, the, the street restaurant you know, huts out there. They keep them out there now because they don't know what's going to hit next. They want to be prepared. But God can do things. In a, and I, I thought about this. See, God can shut down the whole world like that. In a few days. As a matter of fact, it don't have to be, but it just, you said had graduated. Here, how can we get hit from here to way out in Australia, to New England, to, to, to come on here, to Barbados, to Trinidad, Jamaica, come on, Puerto Rico. Come, how did this thing hit everywhere? Looks like we can keep that in a pocket. This is one area. It traveled quickly. And we lost over a million people in no time. I'm just telling you how we need to be so close to God that nothing going to change our walk with him. The children of Israel didn't understand. They just got delivered out of Egypt. But the problem was Egypt was never delivered out of them. They still had an Egyptian mentality being locked down, beaten by Pharaoh. And when the man of God came to bring them out of Egypt, they couldn't appreciate it. They start murmuring against him. And God said, you're murmuring against him. The truth is you're murmuring against me because I am the one who have sent thee. Did not he tell uh, uh, Moses? He said, who shall I say sent me? He said, tell him I am. That I am have sent thee. When the man of God is speaking, he's the I am of God. And so they begin to murmur, but they don't understand. They were murmuring not against uh, Moses and Aaron. It was against God. And God said, let me consume them in a moment. So now Aaron and Moses, because of mercy, they said, let's get quickly a, 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 a censor and, and, and let's burn incense and, and let's make an atonement for these people. Verse 48 says what? It says here, and he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed, which means they stopped the plague. But he was sitting between the dead. You know why? Because as soon as God sent him consuming them, it started. And they had to stand among everyone who was dead already and the living. Verse 49 says what? Now they that died in the plague was 14,700 besides them that died about the matter of Korah. Now you know what people don't understand? See, you know what this means? It meant this here. When the time Korah... Abitham and um, Dothan had rebelled against Moses. God killed them off. What I'm trying to say to the church, do some folk ever learn? If God killed the whole section of people because of rebellion, why would you walk in rebellion? You next? They don't learn. Here it is. If I knew Korah and them rebelled against Moses and, and he, Moses said, come on down. He said, we will not come down. They rebelled. And God said, now not only you, but your whole family's going down. And he said, if I be a man of God, let the earth open its mouth and swallow them up. But he said, if I not be, a, be, be not a man of God, let them die a natural death. Let them stay on this earth and die naturally. And as quick as he said it, the earth 
opened its mouth and swallowed up Korah and all his family. You know, it's a shame how some folk who, oh, God, help me, Holy Ghost. Mm. It's a shame, I'm going to say this here, how some folk turn their back on the church and you kill your family. Oh, my children going to be okay. No, they're not going to be okay because you know why? You had them stable. Now you're making them disabled. That's a word from the Lord. You, 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 Sometimes you're protecting yourself, but you're killing your generation. It's easy to walk away because you're mad. But what about the children who's now picking up habits of crack, gang banging, disrespect, carrying a gun, shooting people, no conscience of life, don't care about nobody, disrespect elders, you know why? Because they don't have no God in them. Don't you hurt your family. I'm talking to someone right now. Amen. Don't go around because you're mad at a certain thing and you're going to kill your whole family off. Because you may be able to stand, but can they stand? Mm. Lord help us. So watch us here in closing. 14,700 besides them, the other group that died. In the matter of Korah, they didn't learn. They knew what happened, but they see people want to challenge anyhow, and that's dangerous, church. Can I help y'all? It's dangerous to challenge when God told you to submit. Let me say to the church, whenever you're in ministry, God don't tell you to come and challenge a leader. He tells you to submit to a leader. I may get an amen tomorrow morning. Let me say something. God doesn't tell you to marry this woman to compete with her. He said, marry her to complete with her. Amen. See? You, you don't say anything, well, I'm going to compete with you. We fight in a battle. No, we complete in each other. Can't get no amens. Amen. So when you have to understand how God operates, he's a chain of command. That's why the Bible says here, as soon as these 400 men came to David, he became a captain over them. Did you hear that, church? He became a captain, what? Over them. See, now wait a minute. If I'm a captain over you, I have orders as a captain. Have anybody been in a rank of something? Elder, you've been in uh, the, 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 the Marines. So you were your, your a private or what? Wait. Advanced corporal? A lance corporal, see? So now, and then there were people under you, correct? Yes. There it is, see? And William, where you at? William was here. You was in, is it, you were private, you went up any high? What? Special? Specialist, all right? There it is. So it had to be somebody under you. Amen. Because else you just specialize in what you do, right? <laughs> so you have to have somebody. So, you know, and then I learned that in the Army, is it an E1, E2, E3, or an E6? E7? Oh, we went up. Look at that. Went another notch. <laughs> Come on, somebody. But see, there's a rank. There's command everywhere. You understand my point? Amen. You know, you know, when you have children in the house and a mother have a child who's 10 years old and another baby is 3 years old, who's in charge? The what? The, that, the baby should not be ruling a 10-year-old. There's a chain of command, and your mother say, make the baby a peanut butter sandwich. So guess what? The baby said, okay, and I don't want that. Mother said to make you a peanut butter sandwich. That's what I'm going to make you, and you make them a sandwich. Amen. Chain of command. Amen. That baby should not have authority to say, you're going to make me a steak in three minutes. <laughs> no, it don't work that way. See, chain of command. Y'all got to understand submission. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Now, I'm going to take y'all further than this now. Now, I'm closing. See, even wives, submit yourselves to your own husband. But it don't mean, it doesn't mean a man is going to enslave you, but a man should be in charge. Woo, that was weak. That was real weak. Why is that? Because a woman was made for the man. Which means God took you and gave a man a gift. Mm. 
You ever have something customized? They said, that was made for me. God help us. So now, that man is to bless that woman. Treat that gift good. Shine that gift. Polish that gift. Treat that gift well. Because God gave the woman as a gift. You all help. You all got quiet here. It's not a mean. See, people don't understand. And submission don't mean enslave her. It means treat her well because she's under you. I put an umbrella up. My umbrella treats me well. It protects me. So don't be, I can protect you from the sun and the rain. You're under me. Amen. That's why I call it the umbrella. Praise God. So guess what? That's protection. It, it, God, it, notice that the umbrella don't beat me upside the head, puts concussions on me, come on and put bruised eyes on me. No, it protects me. So when you submit under, that man is your protector, your provider, and your player. <laughs> Amen. Those are three Ps. So watch this here. So I want you to see this here. So we are submitting. Then when we come to the church world, watch this here. Submitting yourselves one to another. There's no big eyes, little U's. I submit to you. How are you doing? But when it comes to authority submission, then there's some higher ranks that you got to come under their submission. So let me say again. So if you're ready for change, somebody said, if I'm ready for change, I must accept the challenge. Clap your hands for Jesus. Let's stand to our feet on this morning. Those overall cast would like to give those an opportunity that have not accepted Christ as your savior to do so on today. It's a simple prayer taken from the scriptures, Romans 10 and 9. And for those of you who would like to receive Christ in your life today, just repeat after me. Say, Dear God, come into my heart. I do believe that Christ died and rose again to give me a new life. I receive him in my heart today as Lord and Savior to reign and rule in my life now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. So glad that you were able to join us on today. We really hope that this word has resonated with you and that you come back next week to enjoy another word or watch online with a friend as well. And again, make sure that you are sharing this link with someone that you feel like needs to hear it. We'll see you next week.